Okay, so can we start with your your name, your date of birth, your place of birth, and your current status, please? Okay, um, I'm Marie Elisabeth de Roche Miles. I was born in uh, January 1950, and uh, I became, after a few years uh, as a young teacher, I became a a maître de conférence, a senior lecturer at the University of Reims, Champagne-Ardenne, which is now Reims Ch uh, Champagne, Université de Champagne. I left the university three years ago uh, when I retired, uh, kept in touch, went on to finish a number of tasks with my, my students, and uh, I am now not semi-retired, but, you know, semi, I shall we say. <laughs> And uh, I lived, um, I was a student in Paris um, at La Sorbonne as from 1967 and uh, until I completed my doctorate under the supervision of Professor Roland Marx, who was a specialist of uh, British civilization and British history. Um, he moved on from Paris to Strasbourg where he became the dean of the university. And and uh, I ended up uh, presenting my doctorate at the University of Strasbourg in 1976. A little bit about your, your background, your upbringing and your education, please. Yes, I was... Yes, um, I was... Uh, um, I was... Um, I was brought up initially uh, in a private school in Paris, which was very uh, avant-garde. It was the Ecole d'Application of the Ecole Normale, which was called Ecole de Crolly. Very libertarian, and my parents were both doctors, and they didn't want us to plunge into the traditional system, uh, French system of uh, education. So both my brother and I went to this school where we learned First of all, how to um, be uh, pains in the neck, I suppose, by contesting quite an awful lot of things consistently. And then um, it, it, was, it was a really good background personally, maybe not so good academically because my parents realized early in the beginning of secondary education that we were not really um, getting what we should have in terms of contents and things like that. It was all very well, but there wasn't enough of a push. So they moved me into a private school, which was atrociously difficult for me to adjust to, because first of all, it was just a girl's school. And then uh, after being in a mixed school, which was for me, to me, the norm, um, I had to adjust to a new environment and, and stupid uniforms and things like that, which I detested. And then uh, finally, I went to um, a, a, another, I, I finished in another private um, called Collège Saint-Barbe, which is the oldest, was the oldest college in Paris, in the middle of the Latin Quarter, where I took my baccalaureate. And then uh, a, a year before the required age, because I was 17 when I moved on to the university. And then as a um, source of disruption for the family, as um, we both did, my brother and I, I demanded to be um, financially free from my parents. And then I took a job as a uh, surveillant, a sort of teaching assistant in a, a technical college in the north of Paris, which was very, very tough. Some of my uh, pupils were older than me, but it taught me so much in terms of crowd control and how to manage with kids who are not academic. And uh, I literally learned my job there. And um, I was training to be, um, my idea was to become a teacher at some point. I started with philosophy, that was my first two years at the university at La Sorbonne, and then uh, after 68, I, I was so fed up with the whole atmosphere of the department that I moved on to French, and I did a licence de français. Always kept interest for English because I had been to England many, many times and I could speak English properly at the time. Moved on to a master, which is now a master, but it was maîtrise at the time of uh, British studies with the specification British civilization. And then I was really hooked by uh, Professor Marx and he got me onto his doctoral um, team and I did my um, doctorate in British civilization in three years and finished in 1976. Okay, and would you say that your upbringing was political or were you interested in politics before 1968 comes along? Were you active? 
Yes, my, I mean, the whole of my family was consistently interested in politics. I mean, my maternal grandfather was a militant primary teacher who became an inspector of the uh, Education Nationale in France. And he was also the founder of a sort of um, friendly society for people who, were, who had no money, who were destitute. He was one of the French founders of that. And uh, my great grandfather already had started like this. So yes, we were not militant, but we were always discussing things at home, uh, very openly with my parents. And uh, you know, it, it was part of a normal picture of a family lunch gathering. We always talked about what was going on in the country and how we positioned ourselves uh, compared with what was going on. Yes. And, and did you have a, an international perspective? Because your, your English is, is, is obviously very good. And you said that your English was very good then. So yes. did you have a, some sort of international perspective at the time? Yes, I mean, uh, my parents, uh, because I was a little bit uh, rebellious, shall we say, they sent me to England as a very, very young, um, as a child, literally. And uh, I, I loved Britain immediately. And I always had this uh, the perspective as seen from the other place. Uh, my father was a bit the same because he had been sent to Germany in the 30s as a very young teenager. And, um, you know, there was always this tradition of having people from all over, really, um, in the family, among friends and things like that. So, yes, um, I, uh, and I was used to reading the British press. And, uh, you know, there, there were many, many things which always happened. And we always tried to see what was being said outside um, France as such. Okay, so you have, um, uh, before 1968 comes, you have a, an experience of the university system, but you also have quite an interesting experience of the, of the, the, the high school at Lycée um, situation as well. What, what were you thinking about the education system before 68 comes? What were your impressions? My, my first problem, I never went to a lycée because I, I was nine years old when it was time for me to go into secondary education. And I was nine and a half and I was refused at the time uh, because uh, there was such a crowd of, of teenagers at the time and, you know, the baby boomers that uh, they took people who were just in the right sort of 10 to 11 and nothing else. So that's, that was the reason why my parents, you know, left me in private education, which has nothing to do with the private education in Britain. It wasn't an expensive place. It wasn't selective. It was nothing of the kind. It was, it just happened to be pretty good there and uh, close to where my parents live. It wasn't uh, any form of, there was no religious whatever background and people were led to behave the way they behaved apart from, as I said, it wasn't even a uniform. It was this stupid overall that we had one week was light blue and next week was kind of navy blue. And I detested that naturally, you know, but um, the, the world of the lycée to me was totally unknown. And when I went into the university, I'd never been to a lycée, I'd never been into the public sector. And it was then that I discovered, you know, what a, a public environment was. And what did you make of the university system? Well, as, as I said, I was, you know, I don't forget I was salaried at the time. I started working the minute I could and um, I had to combine my normal working day because at the time we were doing uh, 49 hours uh, in the week and I went to night classes mainly at the time. Sometimes I went to um, a cour magistrale, you know, but I found it totally depressing because I remember this chap, I mean, I will, I will not say the name, but he had this course, you know, on, on, on kind of yellowed paper, which was corned up like this. And he turned it very, very carefully because he had been repeating the same things year after year after year. And he hadn't, ch he hadn't changed a, a you know, comma into his, his presentation. And I thought, what's the point? So I, I went to the, you know, the university bookshop next door and I bought his, his course, which you could do at the time. And I never went back. I mean, maybe I went twice, I think, and that was it. I didn't need to go. There was no discussion. There was no exchange. And it was like mass teaching. You know, you were at the receiving end. And to me, it was totally, totally uninteresting, frankly. And I, I did remember that, and I quoted that to my students all throughout my career, saying, imagine that, huh? <laughs> How would you like that? When you think back um, to the period just before 
the events explode. Was there any sense that something was coming? Um, not at the time. I thought not for me because I was too young and I was in a fairly protected environment. I, when I went to the university, you know, at the age of 17, it was at La Sorbonne, which was a really nice working environment, even if the actual teaching and things were not totally satisfactory, but there was no threats. I mean, I had a couple of friends who were at Nanterre. Nanterre was a terrible place, even for them physically. You know, one of my friends was attacked uh, when, one evening getting out of the university, and it was, it was just unimaginable. This thing had been built, you know, in, a, in an environment which was absolutely terrible at the time. Even the public transport to get there was not satisfactory. It was, it was an awful place. And in the middle of that, you had some people who were trying to build something. Going to Nanterre for me was a total eye-opener, and it was certainly not a place where I wanted to go at any point because it was physically dangerous. It was in complete chaos in terms of organization. And, uh, you know, it was an eye-opener in a way because I had been so privileged in being at La Sorbonne and uh, literally walking 200 yards from home to, to get there and, and do things like that. And it was, it was a totally different environment. Uh, that, that, that was what we called afterwards, you know, the massification of universities and higher education. And it was a symbol of something which hadn't been thought properly, not been located properly, and there wasn't enough money behind the, just the physical project. I'm not even talking about the, 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 the professors and teachers who were there, but just the way it was done was an absolute disgrace at the time. Yeah. And you, met, you mentioned earlier um, the, the baby boom generation. Was there a sense that, that something culturally or socially things were beginning to change or there were tensions on that front? I, for me, I, I would say there were tension because I was in a... I don't know how to put it, but compared with an awful lot of my friends, I'd always had, you know, a lot of freedom with my family and there, there was no, there was no fight within the family between my parents and myself because I, w I had a lot more freedom than an awful lot of my, my friends, you know. Um, so for me, um, it wasn't very surprising that people demanded a bit more of this and a bit more of that. I remember this story about not there with my two friends who were there. They had students' uh, lodgings there and they, they, they were not allowed to have, uh, I'm not talking about my boyfriends, but their, even their brothers, when they went to visit them, it was a problem. So I thought, you know, what, what is that all about? It was, it was stupid at the time, you know. And I, I wasn't particularly revolutionary, but I thought things were just badly organized and they were sort of creating an atmosphere of resentment in many, many people. It could have been smoothed out so easily, but I suppose at the time, um, perhaps my family, uh, we were not particularly representative of the way the French society was still very, very traditional, you know, and very sort of um, crispy. If you were there any international um, events or issues that were beginning to have a, a bearing on, on what students were interested in at the time? Yes, of course. I mean, there was the Vietnam. I mean, anything to do with Vietnam was, was used consistently by um, a student's organization. And I, I remember seeing the most terrifying pictures on TV, again, discussing that a lot with my parents. And yeah, the Vietnam crisis was, it was one thing which was a little detonator in many, many uh, instances, and in Nanterre in particular. Uh, there, there were committees, uh, pro-Vietnam committees everywhere. There was something which was boiling at the time, you know. But it was, there was a continuum, you know, it had, uh, in France, I mean, I, I remember my, uh, that's one of my early memories. I remember when the Suez crisis came up, my parents and my father in particular thought that we were on the verge of another world war. And uh, they were very worried about that. And I spent my whole childhood being told, I mean, tetanized at the thought that, you know, communists would 
come around and invade because it, at some point it could have been a reality and I had friends, uh, my parents, uh, friends in Germany for example, they couldn't move, they couldn't get out of the country because they ended up on the other side of, uh, you know, on the wrong side of the wall and things like that for me, I mean, not being able to travel, not being able to just see your friends if you want to go to England or something, it was, I found it terrifying frankly. So can you um, tell me how you started to become aware that something was happening when the events start to? I was, it was quite, I mean, for me, it was very quick because I was in the philosophy department at La Sorbonne and uh, somebody told me, but I think, I wonder if it, it wasn't a myth. I need to, to revise that, I re revisit that. Somebody told me that uh, my department, but again, I wasn't there physically during the day. You know, I came there at night most of the time. So we were the first department to import a piano into the uh, La Cour de La Sorbonne, you know, the courtyard. And there was a sort of atmosphere of, uh, a carnival more than anything else initially it, it, it didn't sound terribly you know serious or anything and I remember the, the the sort of tipping point was on the 22nd of March which started this movement and then things started being a bit more aggressive and then there were all these big demonstrations Ruguet Lussac if you have an, an idea of the geography of uh, the Latin Quarter and uh, it was becoming physically complicated, you know, to be on the tube, which I was, you know, and uh, I remember particularly one day at the end of May when um, there was a big demonstration at L'Odéon, uh, near no, Carrefour de L'Odéon, and I was trying to come out of the, the metro at the time, and there were, um, uh, what do you call them, not laughing gases, um, you know, the... the yeah, gas lacrymogen, that's right, which had been sort of delivered at the top, and there was a reflux of people going down the, the stairs there, and I honestly thought I was going to, to finish crushed, you know, and uh, that was very, very frightening, I must admit. And after that, you know, I... I, I sort of, because the, I mean, the university was shut anyway, there was nothing one could do. I sort of extracted myself from that because I thought, one, I'm going to lose my job because if I don't get my exam in June, that was the rule at the time. Huh? If you didn't pass your exam in June, you would not be readmitted in the, you know, as a, as a surveillant. Uh, so you had to, you had to succeed and uh, pass your exams. And I was getting more and more worried about that because obviously I had put myself in a position of having a rent to pay and look after myself. That was my decision and there was no way I was going to go begging you know, at my parents. And uh, it was becoming very, very tough. Um, and I mean, the, the, the classes and the courses had stopped, everything had stopped. There was more and more unrest in the street. And finally, it was becoming difficult to get to work uh, in the north of Paris where I worked. And, um, you know, it, for me, it, was, it wasn't a happy period. There was no way. I, I remember that as a liberation or as a whatever. It was a, a period of intense worry, uh, wondering how things would evolve and whether I would be able to pass these blooming exams. And finally, we had to wait until September. All our exams were postponed in September. And, uh, you know, I still had to re-sign my contract and uh, keep on living one way or the other. So... It's not a fond memory for me, you know. Well, that's interesting. Um, did, you, did you become involved in any way, either at the university or in your job? When things I tried. I, I did try to go to some of the AGMs there, and uh, not the AGMs, and the general meetings, you know, and I tried to, I mean, actually take part in the, in the um, discussions there. But Assemblée Générale, to me, were a place where initially I had the naivety to think that one could express oneself, but that was absolutely not the case. There were always a bunch of, of boys, you know, on stage, and no girls. No? Very often there was not one female. You can see the photographies which are, you know, which every now and then come out again. Um, and whenever you were trying to say something and say, I'm not quite sure that I agree with this, you were absolutely abused verbally when you were not abused physically, because it did happen, and you felt absolutely threatened. 
um, unless you were part of the, the, the movement or this or group or that group, it was impossible to express yourself. And funnily enough, years later, when I was reading um, Fritz Stern, you know, the, the very, I mean, very, very good American uh, historian, he was telling about his time at uh, Columbia in 1968 when everything erupted there and funnily enough he and a few of his colleagues german ones in germany people i met many years after that in uh, many meetings you know at various universities all over the world they all said the same because they were trying to say something and may i object to this particular point and suggest and woo, you know you were immediately overwhelmed by criticism or you it, it wasn't physically safe to stay there so after, I think I went to three, and after that I thought, okay, no more because it's not leading me anywhere. And I literally dissociated myself from these kind of constant meetings which went on for hours and people were arguing with each other. Um, it never ended anywhere, you know, and it was so frustrating initially. And there was a worry of thought at the time. It was you had to conform to the dominant ideology of the time and that went on with the university for a long long time it kind of polluted the debate and i mean if you were trying to express any form of dissent you know that that was it you started a pandemonium and it uh, it was safer for you to just leave huh? yeah and what about in your employment? Did that did the strike start to take hold? Yeah. I mean, where we were and where I worked was in a, a fairly deprived area in the north of Paris, northeast of Paris, and uh, they, they were. I mean, it was a technical college for you know youth who were not very academic, and parents were trying to make ends meet at the best of times, and there was no politicization of any kind there. I mean, life went on, the kids were there, and, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was such a, that's, that's what really annoyed me sometimes at uh, La Sorbonne and places like this. These people who were creating havoc there, they never went to these particular places where people were particularly deprived and where there was not a chance in hell of accessing any form of academic education afterwards. Um, and I remember when we went back in September 68, after the summer, after the, the spring, you know, and et cetera, of, of discontent. I mean, some of these guys who were advocating for total revolution and et cetera, they had been to America on holiday. They had been here, they had been there, but what money with? I mean, obviously their parents were behind to sign checks because they, they were total bourgeois in many, many ways, you know, and most of them were incredibly comfortable. And I, when I discovered that, you know, it kind of, it grated even more, if you see what I mean, because it was a form of betrayal. They had a sort of double life. I remember in particular somebody who's still fairly well known in France and her son is a, a big cheese in a television um, channel in, in Paris. Uh, she she was she had a she was a, a professor of well not professor she was a um, an assistant or a maître assistant of uh, sociology. She had a TR4, I mean a TR4 that she parked really really far away at Les Gobelins, you know, in Paris. If you have an idea of the geography in Paris, and then she walked to La Sorbonne so that nobody would destroy her car. And she went to the demonstrations, and I did, I, I found that I found that one day because I was walking there. I thought, I mean, what kind of an attitude is that? You know, it opened my eyes in many many ways. And I remember as a group of students we were invited to her place in the 16th arrondissement in one of the most prestigious streets of the of the whole capital city. You know, and. Uh, it, I understood that there was there something of a dual language, you know, and, and an attitude which I didn't like very much. And I was verified so many times afterwards, you know. I mean, when you see where the various people who were at the head of the 1968 movement, where they ended up, you know, uh, at the head of a big paper, uh, at the Assemblée Nationale, or, you know, or whatever. They got out of the whole thing, um, maybe a bit bruised for some of them, but an awful lot of them ended up extremely comfortably and really um, supported by their background, you know. So 
there's a form of hypocrisy I find extremely difficult there. Yeah. How did you experience life um, when, when the strike took hold, sort of day to day, getting around? Well, I, as I said, you know, it was complicated to go to work and uh, I still had to be in work. And uh, the, the people I worked with, they were so much more down to earth, you know, in many ways. Uh, I, I got pretty irritated after a while because you, you couldn't do any work. You couldn't take your exams. Um, there were two worlds, you know, and I know that the movement obviously uh, went on to Renault and, and various big factories. But people on the ground, you know, they, they, they were not particularly militant where I was because they were not in a very big factory which was highly politicized like Renault. They were not part of any form of trade unions. They were just trying to make ends meet on a daily basis. They were a completely different lot, if you see what I mean. And uh, for me, it was also um, rather salutary, you know, that I could end up in a... I could start my professional life in an environment which was so different from the privileged background I'd had. I mean, these kids, I had constantly tell them, well, what do you think about this? And they were not used to expressing themselves. They were, if you prefer, they were trying to fit into a mold. And I kept constantly saying, okay, but does, does that suit you? It, what? I um, mean, why, you know, are you questioning this or that? And they were just flabbergasted that I could ask questions like that. I mean, they found it maybe totally irrelevant, but I, at least I did try and, and we, we established some relationship. I wasn't there just to control them. I was there to live with them, which I did. And I, uh, as I said, it's one of my uh, very best experiences ever. Uh, and I had exactly the same uh, opportunity when I became a very young teacher. I chose to work in a difficult district. I mean, in France, you can, if you come top of the, you know, um, sort of list after your selective exams, you can choose the school where you're going to be. Well, at the time, I started living in the house and I decided to go in one of the suburbs where you had extremely difficult conditions for a lot of people. Yes, I went to Reims for, for two reasons. I mean, the, the, the man who was going to become my, my husband at the time had just got a job as a young uh, assistant at the University of Reims, which was just emerging. And I could see that there were jobs there. So I decided to take a job in a secondary school after my selective exam. I could choose any school in Reims, including the really nice little one in the city center, which was so polished and all the kids were doctors and teachers and pharmacists uh, children. But I decided to go to the north of the city where there was an expanding school with a bunch of people who were really interesting. And they gave me a free hand to organize the uh, teaching of English and in particular to start an exchange with a school in Guildford, Surrey. I mean, the, the kind of dichotomy, you know, the enormous difference in between the, the kids who were coming from Guildford and ended up in this fairly deprived area there was interesting. But with the ones I took to England at the time, I mean, some of them have become English teachers. There's one girl who is a barrister and they, they came from absolutely nowhere. There wasn't a chance in hell that they would do something like going to England at the age of 12 or 13 if we hadn't started that with the team I, I worked with there. And again, that was something, I, you know, I enjoyed tremendously. And uh, there was another way of being in this country as well in England at the time. Any excuse to come to England, <laughs> I jumped on it. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about the, the influence that 68 would have on you. But before I do that, I just want to ask a couple of things a bit more specific and you've mentioned some of these already so uh, and these are sort of stereotypical ideas around 1968 so one of the key debates in 68 was the the fact that there was an attempt by students to fraternize with workers did you see this happening did it work what did you think of it Certainly not, in where, certainly not in the place where I worked. There was nothing of the kind because students never went to these particular areas. They went, as I said, to the very big companies like Renault, you know, to the west of Paris or uh, in Michelin, etc. But not, they didn't go to the places where there was not a représentation syndicale. You know, the trade unions were not represented in the areas where I was because there was no major industry immediately close. So 
I, I obviously yes, I was very much aware of what was going on, but I I remember thinking fairly frequently what a fraud that was because an awful lot of these kids, you know, from the university, as I said, they came from fairly comfortable background and they were trying to tell the workers at Renault and places like this that they should go on strike, they shouldn't be paid for months or whatever. Uh, yeah, okay, but uh, you know, it's one thing to preach total revolution uh, if you can afford it, but these people couldn't in many cases. So some of them, and some of the trade unions at the time were very, very Marxist, you know. Uh, I remember their, their role in, in, you know, sort of encouraging that sort of things. But a lot of people were worried, afraid, and absolutely ignored, uh, or simply uh, didn't want a total kind of breakdown of the structure where they worked. But everybody wanted change, that was absolutely sure, but not that way, if you see what I mean. Another quite um, common characteristic associated with, with Mais Pas Sans Suite is this idea of la prise de parole. Mm. Uh, the idea that, that everybody was talking to each other and you mentioned some of this in the university. Was this something that you felt at the time was more widespread or is this an, another myth? Well, again, again, uh, as I said to you earlier on, if you tried to uh, prendre la parole, you know, in, a, in a, an Assemblée Générale, and uh, you, you had uh, the bad taste of not being completely, uh, you know, in agreement with what was being said, you were totally rejected, and it was safer for you to go out and leave the place, you know. Uh, so I, I didn't think at the time it was particularly uh, friendly or even less democratic. Uh, it was not. Uh, there, there was a dominant ideology. You had to adhere to it. And if you didn't, that was it. You know, you, uh, you had to go. And that created some incredible, you know, resistance in the conservative forces of the country. And in particular, in the university, you had these two clans of people who wanted to keep their strict, you know, um, control of the university, like uh, the, the, the professors and people like that, because they were, they felt themselves completely threatened by what was happening. And they didn't see it coming for an awful lot of them. I mean, that's my impression anyway. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that you had, you know, a block of people with ideas which were far from realistic very often, it didn't help the dialogue. Um, when you're going to talk to people, you must expect the people you talk to not to agree with you. And if you cannot take disagreement, frankly, where's the democratic process? Uh, the, the idea that, that you can change things is something which has always been, you can always discuss and um, talk about things, um, negotiate, um, take, give and take, etc. This is something which was ingrained in our family. Nothing was all white or all black or etc. But it was difficult in 68 because the, 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 the clivage, you know, the, the, the differences were so harsh and, and you had two blocks sort of confronting each other. And at one point it looked as if nobody could stand in the middle and say, look, what you said there is really interesting, but why not consider this and that? There was no way you could do that. It was, it was an absolute, I mean, I've read so many things uh, since, um, you know, that, uh, including an awful lot of stuff which is coming out now. I'm thinking about uh, Le Roman Vrai de 68 de Filiou that you might have got. I mean, some of the, the sort of image d'épinal that they are developing, you know, it, it wasn't always so rosy. You could not talk if you disagreed with, uh, you know, the people who were holding the, the Assemblée uh, Générale where you went. So, yeah, okay, it opened up some form of a discussion, but certainly not within the university, because at the time it, it was so violent, the exchanges were basically violent. I mean, Nanterre was an, an absolute demonstration of that, you know. Um, there, there was, there were the, the, the traditional lot and the revolutionaries and, and practically no one in the middle, and there were a lot of people in the middle, could really say anything one way or the other, you know. Speaking of violence, did you 
Did you experience any violence? Yes, I did. As I said, when I was in this, uh, that was the third AGM, and that was when I decided that I wasn't going to attend anymore. When I started to say something, because I, I, I didn't see why I couldn't say something. I mean, we were there to talk normally, and uh, there, there, was, uh, there was one guy who was effectively, uh, I mean, I got a slap in the face, but at the time, you know, we, we said, you know, I, I could have given him about the same, but I, I just, you know, I thought, okay, right, let go, it's, it's just pure, you know, whatever, and I'm not going to be part of that anymore, and yes, because I had tried to, to um, contradict what uh, he was saying in there, there were several groups in at the end of an AGM and I started saying I was I didn't agree with that and why couldn't we have why did we have to always end up with a motion à signer when there was about 50% of it that you disapproved of and then the guy whoa and I said no well I bang <laughs> so and I thought okay right and uh, since I was in a vast minority at the time I thought okay I'll go out because otherwise it's going to be you know dangerous for me and uh, so I, I never ever went back after that and i literally everything was shut at the end of may exams were can cancelled and um, did you experience did you experience any violence um on the streets with the police and yes and, yes uh, i mean i as i said because i was often in the latin quarter um they, they were um, always it was it was a very difficult thing because people were caught sometimes in the middle of you had a really active overactive group of demonstration demonstrators you know students mainly but not only students um, there were other people than just students and they were literally provoking the CRS where so sometimes to have a good go at those kids you know who were destroying everything uh, turning cars over and etc. So yeah, there was provocation on both sides. It's it's quite obvious, and um, it, it, you come to a point when you don't want to be part of that. I certainly didn't because I I I didn't feel I could either bring anything positive one way or the other. There was no way I was going to stop any form of violence or anything. I was just a tiny wee individual in the middle of that. And um, I didn't adhere to the, the kind of violence I saw in the streets because it didn't bring anything. I mean, some of these guys who lost their cars at the time, I remember the guy who was the caretaker of a little restaurant in the area. He had you know, it was his first car ever. He was nearly 50, I think, at the time. He had a very old Dauphine Renault, you know, which was uh, pretty crappy. And that thing was destroyed by those kids, you know, who were revolutionaries and etc. I mean, okay, but, uh, you know, not everybody was in the same very comfortable position to destroy everything and stay on holiday afterwards. Huh? Yeah. Were you aware that, that what was happening in Paris was also happening in other French towns at the time? Um, I, well, it was happening, but it, not, not on the same scale. Um, um, obviously, there were places like, uh, yeah, there was Lyon, uh, Clermont-Ferrand, because of the uh, Michelin, you know, place, uh, Saint-Etienne, etc. The industrial cities were erupting, that's for sure, but certainly not in, as far as I can remember, in the same proportion as what was going on in Paris. Um, it was it was always tamer in the provinces as I was able to witness myself when I went to live there, because when I went to live there I was only 22, and uh, the difference between you know the mentalities in Paris and and the province, even within the university academic circles, was absolutely massive. It's uh, and it's it's still the case in many ways. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a well-established fact now that 1968 was not a French phenomenon, and no, something that happened everywhere. Was that something that was that was evident at the time? Did people feel as though they were part of a transnational thing, or is that something that we? Yeah, I mean, if you if you were interested in in what was happening, I do remember reading, and I was confirmed by many people afterwards, um, and what I'm reading again now, that, for example, LUNEF uh, in France was um, funded by the move, the German movement headed by Dutschka, uh, you know, and, and they were not exactly uh, premier communion, huh? they were very, 
island people, there was, I mean, I, I, I remember reading something about this not so long ago, and that's been confirmed since. Uh, there, there were some funds which were transiting from, from Germany, and an awful lot of these guys, actually, when they came to Paris and they were part of the demonstrations, they were hosted by various families, uh, you know, of, of uh, the students who were demonstrating. So, y yes, there was. A, um, I was aware of what was going on everywhere in Europe, more or less, because of the friends and contacts I had. And my, my um, sister-in-law uh, is from Berlin, and I do remember at the time that uh, things were pretty serious in, in um, German universities. And at the same time, I remember a friend of mine who was in America, and she was telling me about what was happening there, in particular at Columbia, and uh, also in California, and it was, um, it was pretty violent as well. Well, uh, okay, I was particularly violent, uh, if I remember. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what did you think of the performance of the political elite at the time? So, De Gaulle, Pompidou, Mitterrand, Mendes France. How did you uh, think? Well, I'm, I'll try not to, uh, to answer your question with too much hindsight, because that's, that's always difficult, you know, to try and reminisce that. What I do remember is that um, people, ordinary people around me, people who were not in academia or anything like that, they were absolutely fed up with the disorder, with uh, lack of, I mean, at one point there was no petrol left or very little uh, disruption in the transport and the general strike, etc. And a lot of, uh, and, and that, that really translated itself into what happened the elections. When de Gaulle called the elections, I mean, they, he had a fabulous majority you know, because people were basically fed up with the disorder. So I, I do remember this sort of, you know, backlash after, um, after the, the, the May 68 um, events, which was predictable when you think about it, because I would say that 90% of the French population was not in the streets demonstrating. And, uh, you know, it, it was... To me, it was a sort of revolution bourgeoise, uh, which was quite obvious, huh? because uh, because I had the, the the opportunity to work already in a different milieu where people were seriously in pain, you know, and had difficulties. So I could see the sort of difference that was happening there. I knew some of the people who were on the barricade; they were friends of mine, you know, and uh, from not from the university, but from parents and families and etc and i know full well where they came from um you know they didn't exactly have a problem uh, trying to find something in the fridge when they went home huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um i think i know the answer to this question but how did you feel when it all came to a conclusion did you feel disappointed relieved i personally was relieved when uh, we went back in September, although there was still a lot of unrest. Um, but um, yeah, I, I thought there had been, I, and I still think, the more I read about it again, there were lost opportunities at every street corner, and including on the government side, on the student side, on the academic side, because we kept on talking about that with my, the people who became my colleagues afterwards. But there's something which became incredibly important for me, especially professionally, the loi, the law for, you know, uh, established by Edgar Faure, which um, came to fruition in the, in, uh, in the autumn of 68, that was going to seriously change things uh, in French universities. And it did. And what's happening even today is still totally impacted by this sort of visionary exercise, which was a kind of salvage exercise. Yeah, my connection is in unstable, I know. Uh, I've had that. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, when, when you look at what was written, I mean, I, I've looked into that deeply because I remember giving a couple of talks, uh, you know, here or there about that. The, the terms of the law are still fundamental to understand today's French university. And when you see the way French universities are going to be now into regrouping, into more autonomy, everything, all the germs of that were in the law. And I can literally quote the articles where this came from. You know. And uh, that, that's, I mean, to me, it's, it's, it really is interesting and important. 
uh, the whole of the way universities were changed in autumn 68 completely yeah agreed and um, if if we extend the, the the consequences beyond the university world i mean how would you summarize the impact of 1968 um in on france sort of short term and longer term well it it certainly opened up people to a um, um, different view, certainly. I mean, suddenly, yes, it's true that a lot of people started relaxing. I mean, the, the way people lived became a little more honest, maybe a little more open. Uh, but not everybody, you know, uh, was a beneficiary of that. Um, I, I still think that a lot of people were sort of you know, sideline at the time, and a lot of importance was given to literally the um, liberal thinking and people who were already pretty comfortable. And what the crisis we're seeing in French society at the moment is something that nobody has addressed. And if we don't address it, we'll end up, uh, you know, having populist movements who will take over. And that, that's a, it's a, it is a real danger in French society today. There are too many people who have been sidelined by this, that or other. And whichever government since 68, you know, has not taken care of the, it's not a fringe of a big part of the French society. Agreed, agreed. Um, what did your parents make of, of 68? They, uh, they were... Um, they, they, they kept on, I mean, they, they were doctors, so the surgery was open and, uh, you know, people kept coming. Uh, but um, I think they were worried about me physically at one point. Uh, they certainly were because we talked about it quite a few times afterwards. And um, they, they, they were trying to get me out of the way, of, you know, out of trouble. Um, more than anything else, I believed when everything stopped because they, I mean, they kept going and working all the time, obviously, with the surgery being an open. And uh, to, to give you an idea, um, they were not particularly traditional because my mom, although they were both Catholics, and I have to say that, and, and practicing Catholics, my mother was a militant of contraception. And she started advocating for contraception in 1966 before it became legal in 67 and she was totally at odds with an awful lot of other uh, doctors and and uh, she was a gynecologist and uh, you know and uh, so, so there was always this form of, they were not sort of you know blind to what was happening everywhere but they were i suppose relieved yes when 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 that stopped and you know, things started working a little bit more smoothly, you know. They, they were never in awe of any form of authority, if you see what I mean. And that's why it was so comfortable for me. Um, but they were not advocates of total disorder and, and they didn't think, and I still don't think that very much good comes out of a complete disorder. You know, you, you have to allow people to have a reasonable sit down and in English, sit down and talk. And that didn't really happen at the time, not very often. Do you, do you think that your experiences uh, in 1968 had an impact on how you understand France and the way France works? Oh yes, yeah, I mean, for, for a very long time and still, there are still an awful lot of people in power and I'm um, talking about the Serge Julie, for example, and, uh, uh, you know, Condendit and just now and all the rest, all these people who were, uh, you know, the leaders of the movement, they all had positions of authority afterwards. And there is, um, it's very funny now because you can see an awful lot of articles in the French press about the spirit of 68, les 68 tard, you know, and they certainly have influenced the way the society has evolved afterwards, uh, big time. Uh, the sort of libertarian sort of spirit and things like that, you know, yes, yes, it has. Um, not necessarily, you know, for everybody, again, you know, and uh, not necessarily for the better, because it wasn't always, you know, it, again, it wasn't open for discussion enough. Um, if, if you didn't adhere to a credo, which was semi-Marxist after 68 in uh, academic circles, people rejected you. I do remember that, you know, very, very, very clearly. Um, I never was a Marxist and I had studied Marx very seriously when I was doing my first two years in philosophy. 
and I took him seriously. What happened to him afterwards and his dogma and all the Trotskys and all the rest, there was a complete distortion. And to give you an example, there was something which shocked me beyond words when the USSR invaded Czechoslovakia in August 68, the, uh, uh, the, the main uh, the trade unions for you know, higher education in France applauded and, and people like Sartre and Beauvoir, they thought it was quite right to do that. How can, I mean, how can anyone accept that? You know, I was absolutely, I remember fuming, you know, against that and say, how dare they support that? And I'm, I, even when I, when I talk to people now who were, you know, members of this particular trade union at the time, I, I keep telling them, but, you know, I remember some of my colleagues tearing their membership card from the SNESU after that. And, uh, uh, you know, to me, it was a complete disaster that these people were supporting something which was terrible, absolutely terrible, you know. Yeah, very good. Um, do you think that 1968 had an impact on you personally? <laughs> yeah, so personally. Politically, politically or personal impact of 68? Personally, there was a, a big thing. I mean, fairly quickly after... Uh, the new uh, agreements, you know, on working conditions and working hours, this are called the Grenelle, etc. The number of hours that I had to work went down, and that that did count. Uh, my my salary was pretty poor at the time, but it, it was, you know, in line with everybody else who was like at this particular level. Uh, but uh, yeah, things changed uh, in terms of terms of employment in a lot of cases in you know factories and universities in places like this everywhere things started being a little looser uh, it, i mean power was not necessarily coming down from the top and you know that changed in a way uh, the sort of pyramid you know that we had before um kind of changed and it certainly changed in the universities sometimes it was a little more um you know, power was retained in, a, in more subtle ways. And I think that's what people suffer from enormously in a lot of French companies today. Uh, decisions are seemingly made, you know, in a collegial way. You have all these meetings and things, but at the end of the day, somebody has got to make these decisions and it's still fairly, you know, double locked, if you see what I mean. It's, uh, it, it's, it's more difficult to combat when you are in a company in particular today. I mean, in universities, we can always talk. Uh, we've got like tenure, we st still have that, you know, we're still very protected. But in companies, if you start being a little too uh, ambitious in your contradiction of the hierarchy, that backfires massively, even if it's, it's not obvious, you know, if, even if it's sort of semi-soft, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, um, do you think that um, your experience in 68 had an impact on your career? And when I say career, I mean both in terms of the career that you would undertake. And then also, if you did any research, did it have your scholarship? Did it have an influence on your scholarship? Um, 68 as such uh, confirmed me in the fact that I enjoyed working with people and discussing things and talking about things and exchanging ideas because that's really when it started for me uh, it, it had always been the case that we could discuss all things in my family but when i started being in touch with kids you know at the time and young adults i knew i wanted to work in this particular area and i it i was happy doing that and all my my career that the best the best of the very best was the students contact and that's, that's what I've missed tremendously since I retired. I, I always enjoyed having a good argument with students, a good discussion, and start from what they think and trying to say, look, this is my point of view. Can we sort of find some sort of middle of the way? And uh, it, why is it that what I would like you to do is something that you dislike or you discuss or you, you, you don't want to do, you know, I like that. I like this permanent sort of bartering with the, with the students and uh, at a high level, obviously, an exchange of ideas, which um, is something precious. Being in contact with students is the best job in the world and I confirm that. I'm prepared to sign. <laughs> I, I don't disagree. Um, um, okay, we're almost at the end. Um, 
I'm interested in the way in which the story of 1968 has been told over the years. Um, and I wondered if you, if you, if you had a, an opinion on whether or not the way 1968 is perceived in general in France um, accurately reflects your experiences of those events. I think there's been an awful lot of rosy pictures about 68, in particular in terms of the so-called sexual liberation. Um, and, and an awful lot of my girlfriends were coerced into having sex with people they didn't particularly want to have sex with because it was the norm and the thing to do. And I remember a few, um, you know, um, disasters after that in terms of uh, very long uh, stages with uh, sessions with uh, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists to try and uh, come to terms with that. So that uh, liberation was certainly one for the boys. I do remember that very well, but not necessarily for us in many ways. And um, confirming to the norm is something I've always detested and I'm more allergic to probably more than ever. And that was literally what was expected from us. I would like a woman to tell the story of six from the women's point of view and it would be very different from what happened I mean, the number of times when you read the various uh, the, the recent publications they have started giving you know one or two girls who were active at the time giving them the possibility to say exactly what they did at the time do you know what they did most of them because I was thought of that they went back they were in the back office trying to uh, duplicate you know the stuff that we were going to give out and that's what they were doing and uh, they were not making tea because we were not in England but uh, you know that that's the kind of menial tasks most girls were were li literally confined to at the time um, the, the other thing is that um, people I mean think that 68 was completely uh, it changed the French society did in some respect but it wasn't a complete change because if you look at the way, for example, universities evolved until now, there was a backlash in the 70s, late 70s, uh, and uh, with uh, Alice Sonier Seite. I don't know how much you have followed the evolution of the universities. Sonier Seite was the rector of the Académie de Reims, where I was working, and uh, she became the Secretary of State for universities afterwards and she stayed she became a minister you know all the way she stayed a long time and she sort of tried to pull back all the kind of advances which had been given you know in universities uh, tried to reintroduce uh, state power and things and it's only now that things have been you know it took an awfully long time for things to revisit the spirit of the the law la loi for 68, which if you look at it today is being applied you know what more widely than it ever was especially autonomy the autonomy of universities the reality now in terms of managing their own and things like that um, there is uh, also the decisions in terms of what are you are going to teach in the universities the creation of new degrees which is now the responsibility of universities and not necessarily the state deciding that yes you can or no you can't it's it, that that was the spirit of this law and, and it's now being applied and the funny thing is that it was uh, sorry implemented it was implemented by uh, somehow by Pécresse you know under a right-wing government Sarkozy you know it's surreal in some ways the irony <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to ask you one last thing um, and I've asked everybody this um, if you had 30 seconds to sum up your impressions of 68 how would you do it oh, you're trying to have the three words yeah um, I'd say um, predictable chaos because there was so much which had been boiling for a long time in terms of certainly what was happening in universities predictable chaos and then semi chaos afterwards and um, certainly a form of hypocrisy in the intellectual life in France definitely yeah long-lasting hypocrisy 